I had several issues, and I've kind of gone back and forth. I'm going to take a, a, a more easy issue. Uh, recent Republican polls has shown that uh, Governor Justice beating Senator Manchin for the Senate and Manchin defeating Mooney and Marcy. Uh, and some of the polls, be Pacific, was a poll by the Terrence Group, a Republican polling group that is funded by uh, Senator McConnell's leadership team. And... It shows that head-to-head head head, justice in Manchin, uh, justice beating Manchin 52 to 42 percent. Well, if there's a three-way primary race between Justice, Marcy, and Mooney, Justice have 53 percent, Marcy 21 percent, Mooney 16 percent. And then uh, Manchin versus Mooney in the general, Manchin win handily. Mansion against Marcy, also Mansions uh, supposedly win uh, uh, handily as well. Uh, this group has been fairly successful in in twenty in twenty twenty in predicting uh, the successes. Now some of these folks are already locked in. Mooney's locked in what he's going to do, but there are two that have not locked in, and that is Mansion and Marcy. Do you think that this poll will influence whether Manchin would decide to run for the governor or run for Senate, or if Marcy, instead of running for Senate, will also run for governor? The question is, what will Manchin and what will uh, Marcy do? All right, and, and and now of course justice has not committed officially. He's not to that committed, either. but everybody's everybody's assuming, assuming that justice is going to run. All right, Larry, are you up first? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting thing. The Justice Mansion thing is interesting because there are a lot of people who would argue that they both became Republicans, but only one of them admitted it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I do think there's a there's a decent chance that Jim Justice could beat Joe Manchin head heads up. Not so much because of the overwhelming Republican numbers as it would be because some Democrats may stay home on Joe Manchin. Um, it, you know, they've been angry for a long time. And occasionally he leaned over and, and tossed a crumb. But that may not be enough to make a strong Democratic turnout in this state. I don't know. Alonzo. Uh, I think that, you know, polls a lot of the times are just wholeheartedly inaccurate, right? Um, a lot of people that are conservative, we don't participate in polls. And I think that, you know, uh, it's so much so that, you know, it really skews kind of who we're in support of and, and uh, their potential, especially with so much time before the election to really see, you know, how candidates develop. Um, I, I don't think that this poll will influence uh, Manchin's decision, but I think that just his, uh, his idea of where he fits right now in West Virginia, I think he realized he's not going to win, you know, that Senate seat. And so uh, I think that that plays a bigger role in what he wants to do future on, um, as opposed to, uh, I guess you could say, you know, using this poll. Michael? Well, I, I strongly agree with Alonzo about polls in general. I mean, uh, I don't respond to them, and they're, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people that have that same reaction. So, but I, but I think that that skews toward you know the more left or, or you know or against the right side of the of the of the uh, spectrum and the polling population. But I, I wonder how much has really changed since the last four year election. When or when, when Manchin, I'm sorry, the last senatorial election when when Manson was reelected, barely over Morrissey. You know, I don't. I don't. I think Morrissey has, has added to his uh, reputation. That case, West Virginia versus EPA, is a tremendous change in you know in the uh, uh, lawmaking by bureaucrats. You know, and 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 he's got another one, a similar uh, case going now. But so I, you know, that that's I. I just I don't trust the polls and and I. I I, I'll give Joe Manchin credit for being a little more sophisticated about politics than I am. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, going back to the polls, yeah, it's it's been a common frame, and you've been consistent with this, Mike, that you do not think polls are uh, are particularly meaningful. However, 
With that being said, uh, this particular poll in 2020 had an 85% success rate. So that means that it is doing fairly well. And other polls have, and this is probably in the upper half, but it's not all the way uh, to the extreme. So the other polls, even more success rate. So even though there's some criticism of polls, 85% is a pretty impressive number. Uh, going back to uh, uh, the uh, well, what what has changed with uh, with Senator Manchin? Uh, one of the arguments he will make if he chooses to run for Senate, he may choose it for governor as well, is that this bipartisan bill that he passed is going to introduce a lot of money, a lot of jobs in West Virginia. Uh, is this political rhetoric, or is it actually going to happen? Several several folks said it will happen. Okay. So, staying on this uh, theme here. Uh, Let's talk about the makeup of the Senate right now, because when it was 50-50, having Manchin in the Senate was very important to Democrats. And Alonzo, I think it was you who pointed out, or was it Larry that said something about Democrats maybe sitting out on Joe Manchin in this? Oh, that was Larry. Okay. So with a 51-49 Senate, is it as important for Democrats to show up and vote for Joe Manchin if he runs? Is it as important as it would have been if it was 50-50? So if it's 50-50, you've got to think there's more motivation for Democrats to turn out and vote for Joe as opposed to 51-49. Am I reading that correct or incorrectly? You're probably reading it correct, but there's going to be several, uh, <coughs> several Democrat senators have already declared they're not going to run. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is also the, the cycle that there's going to be more Democratic senators up for re-election than there are Republican. They, this kind of every other year or so, it changes around. Also, Arizona, uh, uh, the lady that's gone independent now, uh, that's going to put another real burden on the Democrats. So I think you're... <coughs> What you're saying, uh, Rob, is right, but if we project another two years down the road, or 18 months down the road, it's going to be closer to 50-50 than what it is today. The other aspect of that is a good answer. Well, no, I, I think that, you know, uh, we just haven't seen the events that I feel like are, are really going to shape this actual election. You know, I mean, when, even when we look at the, the Jim Justice and uh, Alex Mooney kind of, you know, uh, debate in this, right? I mean, Jim Jordan is coming out in support of Alex Mooney on March 10th. And I mean, who knows, you know, how much sway it's going to have with a lot of people in the state that are like, wow, I love Jim Jordan, you know, and he's coming here supporting Alex. Uh, what does that look like, you know, in the future? Yes, you me. Also, yes, well, me. well, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, personally, I think that with Manchin and, and just seeing, you know, the, uh, the caliber of candidates that are coming towards him, uh, he really has a, a big decision to make. And I personally think that he his best um, opportunity to you know ever run for president is right now. You know, um, I, I, do I think that he'll win? No, but I don't think that there's a an election in West Virginia that he will win, no matter what he runs for, even if he ran for the House of Delegates. Well, they they've been saying that about him for the last couple so times, and he keeps winning. Maybe not by huge margins, but he keeps winning. But you raised another point I find to be very intriguing, and uh, would Joe Manchin run for president? If we did not have the primary system that we have today, I think he definitely would. Uh, but I don't think that I don't see how he can get through the Democratic primary for reasons that Larry just said well, a couple of minutes ago. As far as Alonzo's point regarding uh, and your question regarding 5050 versus 5149 or 5248, there is definitely a difference between crippling injury and death <laughs> and, um, most of us recognize that without ever mentioning it and yeah if, if you're 50 50 and joe manchin loses there it goes uh so it is a little uh less uh, uh urgent for democrats uh nationally to win the joe manchin seat either because uh, they've got an advantage now or because so many Democrats are going to not run for re-election that it's going to flip anyway. If I understand your metaphor correctly, Larry, and draw the absolute contacts on these. Uh, a 50-50 Senate where a Democrat vice president can break a tie is crippling injury. A 51-49 Republican Senate is death. Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. I just wanted to make sure I <laughs> yes. drew that correctly. And if Joe Manchin is in the middle of that, 
then you're wondering day to day, is this crippling injury or am I dead? <laughs> no, um. <laughs> but you got to think also with the 2022 election in comparison to 2024 is the Democrats don't have that that issue, right? Uh, uh, we know that abortion definitely played a big role in you know mobilizing the younger uh, people in America to come out and t- to the polls. And I just don't think that that issue or any issue right now, the Democrats are leading into 2024 effectively. Uh, the Ukraine war has been a disaster. I think, you know, watching the response in East Palestine, um, uh, just uh, the multitude of, of issues and errors and errors in this administration is going to cause a lot of people that are independent minded to say, you know, uh, I'm not sure if the Democrats have the solution for 2024 and moving forward. Uh, you, you've made two or three points that are ripe for debate or ripe for discussion. <laughs> One, you say you, the abortion issue is going to go off the table. People are going to forget about it in 2024. I I don't believe that. I think it's going to be as, uh, as much of an issue in 2024 as it was in last election. The other thing, the Ukraine war, uh, there is a great nervousness. Well, first thing, uh, Joe Biden's getting high high marks on both the domestic front and the international front for the Ukraine war and the keeping Ukraine afloat. But there's also nervousness that uh, Trump and DeSantis both have hinted the fact that if they're elected, they'll pull out, pull the support back from Ukraine. And that that scares a lot of moderates as well as uh, a lot of Democrats. So I think both of those issues, Alonzo, I, I believe will be more of an issue than what you're uh, giving it credit for right now. Uh, I mean, when we have, you know, uh, spy balloons just flying around, I think people, you know, are, are kind of in a place of, you know, thinking, is my country safe right now? And, and do I think that the Democratic Party has the answers for, you know, the issues of today? I just don't think that it's there, even if it's dealing with the Ukraine uh, situation. Now, there's also another candidate that people said, uh, and excuse me, because this is international, but in Italy, everyone thought uh, Georgie, Georgia Maloney, I believe her name is, was going to, you know, pull support from the EU and, and just cause this big hubbub down in uh, the European Union in Italy. And uh, uh, that was to be not founded. If anything, she leaned into a lot of EU support and um, has been a big contributing member to uh, a, a region that, you know, still needs that partnership. So I don't believe that, you know, uh, a Republican will just come in the office and immediately pull support. But I don't believe that, you know, we should be funding this effort in the way that we are without any type of accountability, no traction of the weapons, no uh, uh more red tape to kind of figure out, you know, if this is the right way to deal with this problem uh, internationally. You know, Ukraine had uh, a large chunk of the Soviet Union's nuclear uh, arsenal uh, during the Cold War. And when they gave that up, they gave that up with assurances from the rest of the world that if something, if there was an aggressive action against Ukraine, that people would back them up. Well, there was an aggressive action for, uh, on Ukraine. They gave up the nuclear arsenal, and the rest of the world made a promise. Alonzo, was the rest of the world supposed to say, you know, that was 20, 30 years ago. Uh, <laughs> you know, who remembers the Wall of Berlin anyway? You know, uh, you're on your own. Well, without the missiles, which would have deterred the Soviet Union from coming in. I, I mean, I think that that just goes to show that nuclear proliferation is one of the silliest, you know, decisions that a country can make. You know, uh, we, we really have to learn by trial and error, and we have to understand states as, you know, people, right? And uh, when you disarm yourself, you leave yourself vulnerable. And so now they've put themselves in a situation that is starting to, you know, look dire more, you know, and more as this goes along. Now, do I believe that, you know, they should rearm themselves with nuclear devices or we should, you know, help them develop that program? Absolutely not, you know, uh, uh, but it just goes to show that that doesn't work. Now, what we have to do is we have to look at what has led to the actual um, conflict in the first place. And this is, you know, uh, NATO expansion. This is, you know, moving the marker closer to Russia and causing them to, uh, you know, uh, basically lash out if there were mexico and uh canada becoming democratic security regime with uh uh, china right we would be asking our president to do something and i think that they have lashed out i think that uh the west has constantly moved away from uh even you know 
talking to Putin or, or creating a conversation. Not to say that he's not a maniac in this uh, invasion is wholeheartedly irresponsible, but we have to understand that you know we sponsored this issue along with all of the European nations that wanted to move closer to Russia. So if, if, if I called you a neo-isolationist after that statement, that would be a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 are, you are actually making the case for Putin uh, and, really. and, 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 and denying the importance of, of NATO and, and, and the Western nations. And, and that is the America needs to lead that and we need to be strong. And only because Putin wasn't convinced that we would react as strongly as we have, did he start this, this latest war. This is just an issue that's going to keep building upon itself, you know, I mean, by passing on uh, different tanks and, and more long range missiles. And, you know, I mean, this is not a, a, an appropriate way to deal with this problem. Peace right? through strength. And let and let Putin and the rest of the bad guys know that if they start something like they did in Ukraine, they're going to get pushed back and they're going to get defeated. That's we, the message that the United States and the Western world need to send. We have the, the exact analogy of Second World War, which we tend to forget about. We tend to say that's ancient history, but exactly the same thing happened Second World War, and. Unfortunately, it got as big as it did and cost so many lives because we took the exact position that you're advocating. I think that these are two completely separate events. How? Tell me because how. Because the, the issue with World War II starting was the fact that trade expectations had actually dropped, right? There was uh, an, an area in Germany where uh, these people were beginning to starve. They were, you know, uh, a lot of their trade partners had stopped giving them the agriculture that they need. It's not an agricultural uh, area. So, you know, his whole notion of, you know, expansion and, and uh, basically invading all of his we're neighbors. We're talking about who? We're talking about Hitler? We're talking Putin? about Hitler. We're not talking uh, about Putin. Uh, Putin is invading because he felt like this is a... a self-defense mechanism. I'm not defending. I think it was a terrible idea. I think that it was uh, an irresponsible maneuver, especially in, you know, the world that we live in where, you know, we do have the capacity to be able to destroy the world 10 times over. Okay. But the problem is that we shouldn't antagonize people and use that giant global order, you know, to try to uh, intimidate opponents. But there was a reason why all these folks wanted to join NATO, and that was because Vladimir Putin said the saddest thing of my lifetime was the dissolution of the Soviet Union, yeah. and then he made overt suggestions about putting it, ba putting the band back together again. So all of the well, Atvias and Onias went, wait a second, we need to get a band of strength going on here because clearly our little nations of five million people aren't going to be able to defend ourselves, and then they reached out to NATO for and, but and, al strength. and also look at Georgia, what it did with Georgia. He mm -hmm. took Georgia back in the fold. And Belarus. And Belarus, yeah. And, so and this is a puppet. Ukraine's not an isolated by, example. By the way, <clears throat> Russia is not exactly an agricultural power either. And Ukraine is. They have a tremendous uh, ability to grow grains and other things. So the parallels are there. And unfortunately, Putin is more like Hitler than perhaps uh, a lot of people would like to think. And this brings us back to the question Bill initially posed, and that had to do with Joe Manchin running for Senate. <laughs> 20, 20 minutes ago, Bill proposed the answer. Well, I, hope, I hope Senator Manchin was following our discussion. <laughs> Bill, it goes back to you for the last word about Senator Manchin. Yeah. I agree with everything said. <laughs> Are you, Rich discussion. Are you, are you sure there's nothing else that you'd like to add, Admiral, no, there? No. All right. Well, uh, that'll wrap up our discussion on that then. And uh, let's just roll with Tone Loke back on the way out then, since that's what we took it on the way back in. On the clock with issue number two is one Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Yes. Uh, will Emily Coors, the foreperson of the Georgia Special Grand Jury, face sanctions for the several interviews she gave this week? Bonus question, should she face sanctions? Oh. Um, after I wrote this question, I turned the news on, and they had an interview or a, a quote from the sitting judge who's in charge of the grand jury. And, of course, he's the guy who has the sanctions whip in his hand. Um, and he sort of indicated, no, 
she towed the line and skirted around certain issues in such a way that he didn't say that's what he wasn't going to do, but he sort of said it's not as big a deal as if this were a regular grand jury. And so that I don't uh, upset the local prosecutors, if you're on a regular grand jury, which is pretty much all we have here, um, you're not to be talking about what was discussed at all. And so our local prosecutors are not going to go easy. They're going to go to the judge and get some sanctions on you if you go out and talk about uh, the grand jury findings. Um, Not so much with a special grand jury, which does not have the power to indict. It really doesn't matter what they say. It's still Fannie Willis's choice to indict a certain person or not indict them. Regardless of what this recommendation does not bind her in any way, it may provide her with some political cover when she releases it. Um, I was fascinated that at one point, one of the interviewers said to Ms. Kors, um, did you hear that when the document was released, Donald Trump said it was a total exoneration and he thanked the jury? She said, she burst out laughing and said, did he really say that? <laughs> Which I thought was kind of a revealing thing. Um, uh, I, this is going to be fascinating to watch it play out uh, because, uh, I, you know, her body language and the things that she said sure made a lot of people think, uh-oh, there's going to be a bunch of names we recognize with defendant in front of them here pretty soon. Um, I don't think she's going to face any sanctions. Now that I've heard from the judge, I thought she was until I heard from him. He's the guy with the sanctions whip. So All right, so what's your question? Um, will she face sanctions or should she? Um, in other words, uh, if you don't think she will, do you think she should? Has she somehow poisoned the well for the presumed innocent people who do get indicted? Bill Stubblefield, you begin. Yeah, uh, Larry, for grand juries, either special or the regular, do they have to sign a non-disclosure statement? I don't know. I think that would vary by state probably, and so it's possible that. But they're ordered face-to-face by judges about what they can reveal and what they can't. And with a special grand jury, it's a lot easier than with a a regular grand jury. And the question that we'll never really know is the impact it's going to have on the prosecuting attorney as she makes her decision of what she does. And will it weaken her case? It will certainly not strengthen her case, but it could weaken her case. And uh, so that that is, to me, the real question is, has there been damage done to the judicial process? And, uh, and all I'm hearing now on national news and it's just sheer speculation by some of the uh, talking heads or some of the folks that analyze the situation for, uh, for the newspapers and magazines. But the heart of the question is, did it do damage to the judicial process? Okay. And I, I really don't see that it did because it's a special grand jury and they can't. They are going to release eventually the entire report. But that will be done after the prosecuting attorney has made her decision. Exactly correct. But eventually they will have all that stuff. And the important thing is a special grand jury, despite that name special, they're special in that they don't have the ability that a regular grand jury has to order the prosecutor or to say to the prosecutor, you indict them now. Let's go. The other aspect is uh, what we do for our 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was honestly going to uh, say the same thing. Somebody to the selfie generation to go on a press tour after uh, the grand jury. But uh, what's funny about this, too, is that, you know, uh, it's thinking what would inspire a press tour. You know, I think that if there was really something uh, judiciable inside of, you know, the grand jury and they thought that this is nail shut, then why would you even go on your press tour? You know, I think that this uh, shows one of two things. It shows an extreme amount of bias in this case, and it shows, you know, just how this is going to play out. I mean, think about this. If she is the type of uh, leader 
I guess, of this grand jury. Imagine the other people that were on the actual grand jury and what type of information did they find to be, you know, incriminating enough to even pursue an actual case. I just think that this is, you know, uh, it just shows, you know, that this is a farce and I don't think that anything is going to, you know, come out of it, to be honest. Is there any investigation into Donald Trump that is not a farce? No, I mean, I think that there was, if there was something... Let's be sarcastic. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Mike Call, do you have anything to add? (laughs) Alonzo's going to help me here. (laughs) Senior fellow, you're up. Well, I I agree with much of what's been said. But the the mixture of, of politics and legal rules... Uh, is uh, creates real real chaos here, and and Trump will will always say he's vindicated and so forth and and uh, uh, but I I don't I I, th- I think it's unlikely that that's that's muddied the waters big time and that what's happened so far so so when the waters are muddied uh, an actual uh, effective sustainable prosecution it, it really drops away so. Uh, you know he he will take advantage of and, and exaggerate the you know the his you know the declaration of his innocence, but but uh, the bottom line will be legally that uh, I, I don't think they're going to burn him uh, in, in this case. Or we we kind of said him we're talking about Donald Trump, but there's actually several several other folks involved, Giuliani and and numerous well, others. He, well, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that, I mean that, that that that's true, and, that, and of course, of course, that's that's important. But but uh, if if they can't, I mean, I, I don't see anybody, even Trump. He's so so you know uh, lofty in his self compliments that uh, he, he wouldn't uh, recognize or let the thought come out that one of his supporters did something bad for him you know uh that that he that he wasn't managing so uh i but that that i mean that's a good point and that that just adds to the many facets and the ambiguity of the whole situation uh, that, that man if i could the very managing aspect would would you include senator lindsey graham in that category of being managed uh well n- n- not not in a you know yeah Boss underling situation, but but in, in a uh, there, there could, you know you you, know, you can make a case that it was self inspired you know on on the part of the senator, but that one, uh, that's, one of, that's a one different. Of the issue. other thing she surprisingly brought up, which kind of shocked me, was how gratifying it was to her as the four person to shake hands with Giuliani. <laughs> when his testimony was finished. And so you can't really read from what she said a particular view of these people because she said, oh, Lindsey Graham was wonderful. He did, you know, he did a great job. And uh, it, it was uh, really kind of interesting to see. <coughs> I don't know what you can read. Every time you want to make a prediction with her, I think you might be wrong. That supports what that supports what Alonzo said uh, a while ago. She she starstruck <clears throat> with her press tour and the comments she made. She starstruck. So. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that she you know is uh, interesting. But I mean, let's really talk about what this is about. This is the art of the indictment. You know, this is saying that this person is guilty. Um, let's try to, you know, balloon this to the media and make it, you know, uh, destroy someone's character without there ever being, you know, uh, uh, an actual indictment there. You know, it's just it's a facade. It's a show. And, um, you know, we have just ate it up, I think, over, you know, since 2016 about Trump. And I think that this is a, a, a testament to it. And I think that that's why people, you know, are just not able to really take this seriously is because they're like, look at this. I mean, you can you tell me? That what comes out of this grand jury is going to make a legitimate trial and and uh, 
actually be fair in the legalese. And I think it's a dangerous blend of uh, legalese and politics just kind of merging. And I think we've just seen that play out in these last couple of years. And I, I don't know what's the, the big cure-all for it, but uh, this is something important that we need to talk about just for the future of our country. I think but it in, in our criminal justice system, the, the default is innocent. Not right. guilty. Yeah. That's the default. I, I believe that what it gives is it gives Fannie Willis. Come closer to your mic there, Lee. Uh, it gives Fannie Willis, the prosecutor, a lot of room to run up to the limits of what they did and stop just short and look reasonable when she does it. In other words, the more people that they say should be indicted, that gives her more freedom to indict three quarters of them. And everybody says that's a hard-nosed prosecutor who doesn't buy the wrong uh, buy the wrong idea, and uh, that's I think what the whole special grand jury thing is about. Um, and and to say this isn't just Fannie Willis saying this; this is a group of people selected at random from the voter rolls in Atlanta or in the Atlanta region. Um, and Alonzo, I want to compliment you for filling while Larry was nearly dying on the table across from you. <laughs> he was turning redder than the wall behind I was him thinking, at one point. I was thinking about the difference between crippling injury and death. <laughs> it was circulating around the room and at I was that trying time. to give everyone, you know, the, the uh, wherewithal to us. They needed to revive them. Yes, good job you know. filling. Get yeah. a career in radio if you'd like one. Uh, Larry, final word goes back to you if you want it. Um, the only thing I would say is that uh, that was certainly entertaining. I don't know that it's done very much to help the clarity with which we need to view these indictments that are coming. Very good. Issue number three, and for that we go to Alonzo Perry. Okay. Well, I think we need to get back more into the state politics aspect. So um, what I want to ask everyone is um, – there's a bill that just passed the Senate um, that or I think it's in the Senate. I, I don't want to misspeak. It's Senate Bill 38. You can look for yourselves. It says, should we eliminate restrictions on voting rights for formerly incarcerated individuals? And this is uh, a restoration of voting rights for uh, every felony, every anybody that has left um, the jails in West Virginia. And would you support it? All right, let's go to, uh, first and foremost, the attorneys in the room. I'll start with Mike Carl on this one. Uh, I, I have a problem with, with doing that. Uh, I, <laughs> uh, uh, the right to vote is a constitutional right. The right to walk around free is, is a constitutional right, and you'd lose that when you, you know, are convicted of a crime and in and, and prison. So, so there's, <clears throat> there's some you know, pattern that you can follow, but, but the right to vote – uh is 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 different i think than just the right to walk around free and so uh now correct me uh, or clear me up you you incarcerated prisoners don't vote do they uh so it uh, currently i mean formally, currently yeah i think that people that are in prison won't be franchised with this okay so okay. then the current just, law is that they're not yeah, yes that, that, that yeah the that, current so, law so, is so the, not even the voting right is suspended yeah. under current law generally for people incarcerated but which i just assume was the case but but to i mean the the return of your freedom to walk around you know you can be on probation and have to check in and all that stuff you know uh uh, there's no reason to separate that from the right to resume and the right to vote, I mm -hmm. say. Bill? Yeah, I'm a little confused. I tried to find that last night, Alonzo, and I had trouble finding it. Uh, I know some states, we're not the only state addressing this issue. Minnesota just recently said that uh, folks in prison can vote. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't think we should go that far. However, I do believe that if someone has served their time, has complete, completed their legal uh, obligation, i.e. parole, whatever the case may be, uh, they should be offered this this right uh, to vote. Uh, we cannot. Uh, we we can all give examples of individuals that really should not been rewarded the right to vote 
but for every one of those, we can cite examples of people that made a mistake. They should not be, be penalized the whole life. So I think uh, once they have completed their, their legal obligation, they should be allowed to vote. But again, I could not find that bill last night, so I'm not really sure what it says. Let me weigh in with Matt Harvey, the Jefferson County prosecuting okay. attorney here, who says that felons already automatically get their right to vote back in West Virginia. It restores after they have completed their sentence. Hmm. So what does this bill seek to do that's different? Different than that, Alonzo. Do you know yeah. that off the uh, so, research you have on this? I actually, if that's the case, then I, I, then what is I that Senate know. bill trying to do? So, it sounds like it's trying to repeal that. <laughs> Was it trying to repeal the ability to vote after yeah. you've completed your sentence? Yeah, that's what I thought. I, yeah. If if that's the case, then Bill, you would obviously be against that. I would be against it if that's the case. Yes. Yeah, but Larry. Um, yeah, my understanding was that. Um, in a lot of states, at least, I, I don't. I, I certainly wouldn't argue with a, a sitting prosecutor. Um, my understanding is that after you finish your obligation to the state in terms of serving your time, then they restore voting rights. I know in Florida, some years ago, they passed a constitutional amendment to restore those voting rights. To which, after a few years, Mr. DeSantis responded by saying, "Well, wait." What about all the court fees and fines? If you haven't paid those, we're going to add interest to it. And until you pay those, you still can't vote. Uh, uh, boy, that sure sounds like you're saying, uh, okay, convicted felon, you served your time, but you haven't paid all your fees and court fees and fines. Well, what, what about all the the rental value of their prison and food and all that? Right. I mean, <laughs> you could stretch that forever. And it seems to me that we, the idea of our prison system, whether it's um, true or not, is that it's supposed to be really rehabilitative. Uh, they, you, you, you learn from your mistake and you eventually get out of jail and you're a better person. Obviously, your rights ought to come back. Your right to walk around comes back as mike said um and so your right to uh your right to vote ought to come back too. I, don't, I don't think the philosophy of going to prison has been rehabilitative in, uh, in quite some time i think it's been punitive i haven't talked to anybody that's come out of a maximum security prison i think the last thing that they'll tell you that's happened to them is is they learned how to be a better human in prison i, I mean i i would agree as a practical yeah. matter that's true but still so, they tell us i think there's a great uh, truth to the fact that they learned their lesson and they're not going to break the law again. Well, then why is there such a high recidivism rate? Because those people didn't learn their lesson. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> oh, hey, that's logic. <laughs> but but, 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 but I, I don't know what what that rate is. You know, what, hey, uh, what, Stacey, I haven't heard that statistic. Stacy Burkett uh, said uh, she thinks the bill is addressing those under home confinement and on probation who are working and paying taxes. Yeah, this is true. A person. Uh, Good, so okay. Alonzo, you got it. Yeah, the actual amendment is saying that a person's right to register to vote is automatically restored upon his or her release from incarceration for such felony conviction, whether or not the person is on probation, parole, or supervised release. So it's a, it's an automatic, I guess, restoration as opposed to signing up for it. I mean, By the way, Mike, the, the answer is 68% recidivism rate. Okay. Yeah. There, for, for, for all crimes. According to... FirstStepAlliance.org. Not, not, uh, murder and all crimes. Huh? Studies have shown that more than half of prisoners, well, if you murder someone, you probably didn't get out. So, yeah. I, But there, there's, a, there's double standards, with the, even within the state. I think I'm correct on this, that a, uh, a statewide office, you're, you cannot run, a, run for and hold a statewide office if you're a convicted felon. That does not hold true for county offices. You can be a convicted felon, provided you've satisfied your parole and still hold a county office. Hmm. And you that? can certainly hold a county office if you merely should be incarcerated. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there, you know, Sorry, Bill. We're all, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot to touch on with that locally with, with all that's been going on. So anyway, uh, Alonzo, we go back to you for the final point on that. Well, I mean, I definitely misinterpreted the bill uh but i think it's good to talk about you know what uh what is the 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 things that we should agree on you know in terms of what should give someone the right to vote right and um 
you know, I, I think that we're all too dismissive of citizenship and, and the ideas of, you know, uh, when you're arrested and you were arrested for a crime that violated somebody else's, you know, uh, civil rights, you know, it, 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 I don't believe that those people should be able to vote. And I, I was worried that this was one of those, you know, uh, police or one of those criminal justice reforms that were kind of like, you know, uh, even if you're a felony and you did something violent to another person, you know, that eliminated their franchise, that you would be able to be uh, franchised. And I, I, I didn't like that notion. So um, with that, I mean, um, I actually really enjoyed, you know, the dialogue here, and I agree a lot with what Mike Carl said here today. Circling so. back on that, though, I don't think we answered this question here, which is at the fundamental root on this. Philosophically, why should you lose your right to vote because you've been convicted of a crime, Mike Carl? Well, uh, you lose. Uh, that's just another right that you lose. The, the freedom to free movement, you lose that right. So the right to vote isn't any, you know, doesn't have a different you, you lose your in, 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 fa in fact, that you're in that position raises questions about your capacity and your ability to vote in a decent way. But why? Why? I think we're picking and choosing what rights we're denying, though. Well, one of the it, one of the right? rights I mean, you also lose besides your freedom is your First Amendment rights. You lose a lot of your First Amendment rights. You can't. You can't publish uh, newspapers from the jail. They're going to restrict your ability to um, uh, to write now. You can write letters to people. You can say what you want to say. But you don't, in the prison, enjoy the same freedom of speech that people outside the prison enjoy. But courts have um. upheld prisoners' rights to transition while they are in prison. Chelsea Manning. Mm -hmm. So why do you have the right to transition while you're in prison, but you don't have what, the right what, to what vote? What do you mean transition? <laughs> gender, gender transition. Change? Oh. Yeah, you left out an important <laughs> adjective. <laughs> he, yeah, he, he, they didn't mean move to Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yes. So, but, so how, do, how do you have the right to do that in prison, but not the right to vote? That's a good question. And it would depend on, <laughs> it would depend on the had, jurisdiction. It hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm not so sure that they would uh, uphold that right in the West Virginia courts, for example. But the federal courts may have upheld it, and they're two different and, jurisdictions. Depending on where your crime is and who prosecuted you, that could make a difference in some of your rights. See, but it's, I, I, it's, it's a mixture. And, you know, we have to understand where we cross the line. And I guess uh, a big summation of this would be almost that, you know, governments are supposed to protect us from each other. We're not supposed to, you know, protect or the government isn't supposed to protect us from ourselves or, you know, try to make decisions for our, our you know, uh, person or whatever as an adult with a f legal functioning mind. And a lot of the times these people that are incarcerated is because they perceived some societal harm towards their community right and when you violate other people's rights or whatnot then yours should be taken away so i, I think it's a fair trade-off now i don't believe that you know maybe non-violent offenders should get that same treatment you know and i think that this blanket of just felony you know uh is probably an inappropriate way to actually uh, to do this problem, but I mean, if you physically are harming someone, you're you're causing you know damage to uh, life, liberty, and you know their property. I mean, that you right there are are obviously not living under the same code of laws. We are a nation of laws, and you know you shouldn't be able to influence our laws with you know uh, your behavior and the type of you know uh, perception that you've put out in a society. So uh, I think that's my my kind of whole view you mean at least until you've paid your price uh, yes paid yes. the price yes and does that include all fines being repaid boy i sure don't yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that's part of the sentence right your sentence it, is 10 years and five thousand dollars yeah and and it, it does but but we've been really careful in this country to avoid saying to someone oh you're poor oh well you can't vote <laughs> but, We've but, been real careful, right? About making that. a distinction but, based on your your 
resource <laughs> but, but in Rob, terms of your rights. Rob, your point about fines differs from what Mike was talking about a while ago. Mm -hmm. In case of Florida, they were trying to say, we charge you for all the fees, all the uh, yeah. all the food, Mike, everything else. What about else. the fine, though? Uh, well, the, the fine is part of the sentence. Yeah, the fine, I don't think, was challenged. It was the it was the add-on. No, I'm asking the about the fine. That's why I asked oh. that separately after the discussion about the expenses. Yeah, I think the fine's part of the uh, of the uh, the verdict. I think. Well, I think Larry just disagreed with me on that, though. Well, and I, I just I, I mean, a fine may be a part of the verdict. I just think we have to go real careful about saying you're otherwise qualified to vote. You're just a little too poor. <laughs> well, you've been in prison. It's hard to have a job when you're in prison. But generally, that's not a very employable that's, resume. That's just a bad, it seems a bad precedent <clears throat> to me. Mike, pay the fine or not? I, I say uh, it, it's just another means of, I mean, they're arbit the fine amounts are arbitrary, and it's just another uh, means of, of, of uh, you know, uh, property you know, allocation and and I, I I think it should not be uh, required necessarily because the amount of the fine is arbitrary in the first place. Well, I don't think we should put means tested on whether or not you can pay your fine or not. The fine is part of the verdict, just like going to jail or going whatever the case but, is. But the, the amount of the fine is absolutely arbitrary, and and why should a very wealthy person have an ease to of of, of you know. Uh, Paying for their their mistake more than than a, than, a, than a poor person. Then you blame the judge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, and the, uh, the judge has to read the statute that has the amount of fines. Judge, you know, yes, and yes. Fine. exactly right. That's that's and, not, that, and that's, that's arbitrary. A, that's only one paragraph. That's Mike. arbitrary. <laughs> it's ridiculous. All right, we take our break here. So uh, the uh, anchor leg of the program, Mr. Mike Carl. I wanted to go back to the state legislature but uh, not the not the tax issues which of course are a big deal but uh there are several bills and one of them's called the third grade success act that are really tightening the screws and or, or but in a constructive way of improving uh the uh, uh success of lower grade students to move up and 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 it's you know it they they have to pass a more serious tests to to do that they're given all kinds of support their you know some there's a lot of different uh, aspects of these bills the parents didn't get involved but but uh it looks like it's moving and i'm asking do you think that this is one way that it will make our uh teachers more accountable in an earlier reading of this bill, and I'm not sure if this is the final version or not, it also gave teachers the authority to hold students back. Oh, uh, it, it required them to hold them back yeah. at, some, at some of them. Yeah. 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 Uh, Absolutely. Go ahead, Alonzo. I, I can think of nothing more cruel than, you know, allowing a, a third grader to move on to the next grade and not know, you know, their their basic math fundamentals uh, not know how to read. You said you know, cruel, not I, cool. Yeah, no, cruel, okay. cruel. <laughs> it is it's absolutely a cruelty, you know, to to let that to allow that to happen. And the fact that this isn't in place, you know, I think is uh, more detrimental than um, anything that we're doing in education right now. Uh, you know, we need our kids to know those basic fundamentals to grasp everything else in our curriculum. And I think that our literacy rate, you know, is uh, not reflective of us being honored. You know, to that uh, that obligation. I mean, that's what schools are designed for, right? We have to equip people with the tools to be successful. And uh, even if it's you know tough love by saying, hey, you know, this kid is not prepared to move on to the next grade. You know, we need to do that. We need to do it young to make sure that we intervene. Billy, yeah, I have not read the bill, Larry, uh, Mike. Sorry, uh, but you used a word that uh, that. It caught my attention. That was holding the teachers accountable. Uh, certainly we hold the teachers accountable for a lot of things. Uh, but just because we get low test scores, I find that's that's going a step too far. Does the bill actually state in there they're going to be holding the teachers accountable? Well, it has that effect because if, if, if they 
u- using these this process, which which it really holds them more accountable. I, I agree, but it also holds the students accountable in, in terms of of uh, learning. You know, at a, ne- at a at a certain level, to move up to the next level. One 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 of the biggest problems that we've had and that's why i support charter schools because it creates a competition that and and show and 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 the demand for charter schools tells you that the parents of west virginia uh recognize this and and that's why the charter schools are you know are getting the support they're getting and and this this is just more of the same process to uh because the teachers can't just you know check the box and move them up and and say i've done my job you've got to have substantive quality results and that that is a whole different world than the one that we've been led into and one size fits all uh in west virginia in the last three quarters of a century and this is a to me a great improvement and it's a part it it, it, just like the charter school system because it creates competition and responsibility for uh teachers to uh help children. I mean, it, it sends them, finally, to really do their job. Well, Mike, nobody can disagree with a lot of what you say, uh, and I think one thing of not requiring the teachers to promote the student would be a step in the right direction. Uh, and I think that the fact that our test scores are so poor, uh, there's a lot of improvement that can be made. However, over the years, education has drifted more from what happens in the classroom to a cultural affair. And uh, so I don't think that we can hold a teacher responsible for all the, uh, the the cultural impacts that's making it more difficult for a student to learn. Well, in other words, I'm, what I'm not what I'm saying is let's don't let's don't let the parents off the hook on this. The parents have to be a full partner in uh, in uh in the progress of the students. I think any any parent that cares about their children will love this. I hope so. Larry. Um, I, I want to see, I want to hear from third grade teachers about parent-teacher night. Do those kids who are in danger of flunking, are their parents at parent-teacher night? Because most of the third grade teachers I've talked to say, no. What I get is two or three kids who are either new in the class, their parents come, or uh, you know, new to the community, or the top students. Their parents will always come to the thing to say, look, is there anything else you need from us, blah, blah, blah. So part of this is, and I would love to see our legislature start um, moving some of this responsibility to where it belongs on the parents. If you're a third grader, you don't care that your teacher told you to read two chapters because if you go home and mommy and daddy don't care, you're not going to care. You don't have to care. And some of these bills, I think, have provisions involving parents. So That's an important part of this. If you're going to make teachers responsible who are only with the child part of a day, the parents who are with them three-quarters of the day or half the day have to step up. And if they're not even concerned enough to come to the parent-teacher night, you're never going to get anywhere, no matter what you do to the teacher. But, I mean, this is a wake-up call for any rational parent, right? You know, seeing that your kid is, you know, being held back, you know, that's that's alarm bells are going to start singing, you know. So uh, I think that this is a positive modification that does exactly what you hope to achieve and what I believe that me and Mike Carl wish to achieve, and that's, you know, consensus in the sense of, you know, we need kids that are liter- or literate and are good in arithmetic, you know, because, uh, one, you know, this is a, a barrier to propaganda. This allows people to, you know, uh, understand, you know, the world around them and uh, develop their other skills, their hard skills. You know, into uh, becoming productive citizens, and I think that we are just, you know, ushering away from uh, the actual, you know, tools that people need, you know, for schools. So uh, this is a, a, an all-around positive bill. I don't, I don't see how anybody can, you know, not support it. I think the only people that would be against this are the same people that are against standardized testing. And have you, like have you read the bill? I have, I have. Okay, I and so it, it shifts, it shares responsibility between the parents. And the and the teachers and there's also uh, well it doesn't have a, a specific clause for that matter it's more or less the um, it talks about 
um, that kids have to, you know, be able to do math and have to be able to be literate and read. These are aspirations. No. And nobody can challenge aspirations. But how do you get to the aspirations? Is it shared responsibility with the parents and the teachers? It's, a re- it's not an aspiration. It's, an, it's a requirement. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's like you, you have to be measured, right. you know, to be able to read. And you're measured to, you know. If then you can, what happens if you do not meet Then you're held criteria. back. Okay, fine. Okay, and there's that, a clause in there for dyslexia and some of the other. Fine. Like, so, so the penalty is. Give up too. Yeah. The penalty is being held back. That's that's yeah, that's the positive. That's right. That's yeah. positive. okay. Fine. And and make no mistake, when a child is held back, there is a social cost that that child pays in the culture of the school. They get treated differently. Not bigger than uh, the impact of not knowing how to. Okay, read. but right. this is a bill that says we're going to wait until failure occurs to do something. No. Instead of saying after the first six weeks of the year. This kid's off to a terrible start. Mom and Dad, get in here now. we got to do something. It, it, in other words, if we're not going to reach out to the parents and make them a full partner in this, it's going to fail. And I then think, you just I think the bill does. The kids. The, if I remember reading on this a couple of weeks ago, the bill does have early intervention um, benchmarks that have to be yeah, met exactly. before all this uh, and, can and take place. And the parents place. are a part of that? Parents are notified. Uh, there are aides in place. And there's a special plan that's set aside early on to intervene to make sure that this child has all the advantages possible. To to and the, the final result is being held back, but that's the last result. It's not. Okay. It's not something that's a surprise at the end of the semester. Oh, you didn't turn in your work. You have to come back to third grade. Yeah. Uh, no, there's there's a lot of early intervention stuff in there too. Uh, and in regards to, to teacher accountability, obviously anybody who gets paid, there's there's no issues with making somebody accountable for their paycheck. But I want to make something real clear on that because i my wife's side of the family is all teachers and so i I have a lot of conversations uh, about teaching with those folks over the years and we've had a lot of teachers on this program who've been on the radio tv sent emails commented on our facebook page about the the job teachers do okay so the federal government hands down laws rules regulations to the states And they hand that regulation down with the threat of money being pulled if you don't follow it. The state then hands it down to the school district. And then the school district hands it down to the teacher. And and, and how many stories have we heard about a teacher saying, I used to teach this subject this way, and it was enlightening, engaging, invigorating, the kids participated. But now I have to teach it this way because there's a test that they've got to take. And I've got to stick to this based on that test that comes out. And, and my hands are tied on a creative way of teaching this, so now we've got to do it this way. And then we've got a discipline, discipline problem in the, in the classroom. And the teacher goes to the principal, and the principal gets involved with the parent. And the parent makes enough of an issue out of it that the teacher is no longer the one back. The principal backs down to the parent. And now the teacher is in between the principal, the administration, and the parent, and the student. And ultimately, it's the teacher who gets their legs cut out from under them, and they don't get the support. I'm I'm telling you firsthand stories from my sister-in-law, okay? So we're going to make the teacher accountable. Okay, that's great. Let's make the teacher accountable But let's give the teacher some control so that if we're going to make them accountable, they could have preemptively had some control over what happened that led to their accountability in the end. Let's not tie their hands and blindfold them and gag them and then hold them accountable because they didn't teach the kid, right? And and let's make sure that none of these things are being passed because the Republicans are still ticked off about the teacher strike and the group that descended in Charleston and screamed at them in their offices. And why do they scream at them? Well, because their labor bosses told them to. Okay, that's one reason, maybe, right? But how about because of all this frustration about being handed orders on how to do things and then not being given any support on how to do it? 
Mm-hmm. And then being held accountable when it fails. Yeah. When they had no control over it in the first place. Uh, excuse me for interrupting the rant. I'm done with it now. That's <laughs> it. But you, you made a, several good points up front before we became too ranty. Yeah, I, I have a tendency to do that. <laughs> That's right. But I want to ask Mike and Alonzo, does this bill address the points that Rob was making up front about if you're holding the uh, teacher accountable, are you giving the teacher the tools to take care of this? Does that bill address that those points? I think that when we are looking at you know uh, how to fix this issue, right? We can't. Uh, there's there's a, a limited amount of good that the government can do in this situation and a tremendous amount of harm. But that's right? never stopped the government from trying. Yeah, this is this is also, you know, true. I mean, they don't solve or, problems. Or interfering, they subsidize say, yeah. them, right? But uh, one of the biggest issues that I see here, you know, is that uh, we're not talking about, you know, the merit of, of whether or not, you know, a teacher is being held accountable by this in the standard that I think that you're asking the question. I think that what we... Uh, are addressing by saying that kids need to read, they need to be able to do basic math at third grade is a a measure that, you know, all of the early grade teachers, you know, know about and are performing in a way that, you know, when it gets to that grade, uh, the teacher has to, you know... But you you have not answered my question. What you said there is aspirational. And are you... Does the bill provide tools for the teacher to make this happen without just pointing the finger at the teacher and saying you've got to you've got to have them meet these meet these targets is there is there some leverage in the bill to help the teachers i don't think that actually in the construct of the bill there's anything how can you like it outlined because it's Uh, it's it's preventing something that is going to lead to further problems down the line if we're talking about you know uh holding teachers accountable right By fourth grade, that kid should know how to read. And if they're not able to read, you know, by fourth grade or fifth grade or sixth grade, then you're going to have kids that fail. And that makes teacher performance look bad later down the line. Yeah, the the bill discusses the science of reading and requires classrooms over a certain size to have early childhood classroom assistant teachers to work alongside teachers in the classrooms. It requires the State Board of Education to develop an illiteracy and numeracy policy for each county to follow. There must be appropriate screeners for learning disabilities. The policy must also include appropriate instruction and accommodations for students identified with risk factors and a system for families to receive information on dyslexia. Every K-2 student, K-2 student, will be screened three times per year. Student in grades three to five who transfer to a new school will be screened at their new school. Okay? That's all part of, of, uh, of what's going on with the bill. That's good. Those are those are points that I was looking for. The uh, related question is: is I assume there's going to be allocation, funding allocation to make all this happen? Yeah. Well, the aid is in you know another bill. I mean, we've seen that that was passed you know last session. Uh, the you know a lot of these things, it, those mechanisms aren't in this bill specifically. You know, this bill is just saying, hey, let's create a measurement to make sure kids can read and. But but it goes much farther than that. What Rob said goes much much. Uh, what Rob said was what I was looking for. Mm-hmm. What I'm hearing for you is just aspirational. Bill, I speak fluent stubble field ease. Yeah. <laughs> I can translate, and I know exactly what to oh, get you. It, it, uh, Mike Carl's getting red in the face, so it's time that he's getting ready to jump in. <laughs> it, 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 it's 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 not a, a, a trade off between uh, uh, accountability and and the opportunity to you know. Uh, achieve your goals and, and, and a, in a meaningful, you know, way that that works. Mm-hmm. It, it, what this bill is adding is accountability, and but it's giving many, many tools to uh, respond to that accountability. So, and and I think- and, and, and and you know, I, if I, if I'm closing here, one last thing is that I think not only will. I think this will add to the uh, movement to attract people from out of state to move to West Virginia. You can talk about you know cutting taxes, but I, but I think that uh, this this way we won't have to worry about uh, uh, people saying, well, well, I'll just send my kids to you know school in Maryland or Virginia. Uh, th- this this will actually help the growth of families in West of families coming to West Virginia. And it lays out a plan for what ultimately is required to prevent a child from being held back and the accountability of the student where you will be held back. Yeah. 
and it's laid out. So right now you might have a situation where a teacher says this student has completed the work necessary to advance to the next grade, and they're overruled because the state needs a certain graduation rate number to get federal funds, right? So that may still be a factor down the road, but at this point at least there's something in the this law. This is a counter to that fact. Yes, absolutely. It does. The fact is I would love to see the statistics between – um, that analyze kids who never had a book before they went to school. Hmm. There are a lot of them. Those kids, I'm just betting, are the ones who aren't competent readers by third grade. That's not to say it's the only thing you got to fix to make this work, but every kid who can hold a book needs to have one in his hands. Um, and, you know, even if it's just pictures... He can learn the words later. <laughs> yeah, I wish all parents read to their kids.